Well, first of all, thank you very much to Giles for the invite to, uh, to do this video. Um, I guess I speak for many uh, if I say that it feels today that the substance of our world seems to be broken. It seems that all the certainties, the certainties that we had are kind of falling apart and that there's no kind of fixed place that we can hang on to. Uh, in trying to make sense of our lives. And also it feels like we are making or we have made lots of bad decisions. That for some particular reasons we are choosing the wrong people to lead us, that we are choosing the wrong stories to believe in, that we are choosing or believing in the wrong economical systems, in the wrong political systems, that uh, our priorities are not really aligned, that we are putting too much emphasis on certain things that are obviously creating problems in our lives and for the civilization as a whole. So the question is, why is that happening? And that leads me, and this video is dedicated to uh, the six new forms of literacy that I believe we will need to start acquiring from a very early age uh, in order to try to at least give ourselves a chance to start resolving some of the problems that we see everywhere around us. And when I say literacies, uh, I literally uh, believe that these are kind of literacies, that that's something that we should be learning from a uh, very, very early age in our elementary schools all the way up. Because these are the things that we do not often learn at all uh, or very, very seldomly. And uh, uh, these are all kind of literacies that other people the system around us, particularly the political, economical system, the commercial and the political system is using against us. I believe there are six key literacies that we need to become really good at uh, and we need to acquire in order to uh, resist the weaponization of the humanities and the weaponization of these literacies against us with pretty bad results, as we can see. What do I mean by that? I mean that very often uh, for the so-called fourth industrial revolution, the post-industrial society, we um, are usually talking about uh, the need for the younger generations to start becoming creative and to practice team working and um, emotional intelligence and a few kind of other things that we believe is going to give uh, people a chance to uh, find their place in the fourth industrial re revolution. But we are only thinking about the economical system, the industrial revolution. We don't think about the civilization as a whole. And I, uh, my very strong impression and my firm belief is that now uh, we have forgotten uh, some key uh, skills that we need to have as human beings as well in order to be more successful in our civilization and to build better a society as well. The very first literacy that I would like to see being taught at school is the archetypal narrative literacy. In other words, storytelling. I believe that storytelling is now not done the way it should be, as a defense from the dark arts, as the defense from manipulation. Instead of we actually learning how to write and how to tell stories, mostly in a way how to, uh, to learn how to better sell ourselves or to sell something else. But actually, one of the kind of key ways uh, how manipulation works and how we are manipulated as citizens is through stories. Very powerful, archetypal, very emotional stories. And as we know, as many anthropologists before Joseph Campbell, and Joseph Campbell is one of the most quoted ones, uh, uh, the hero with a thousand faces, uh, who actually realized that archetypal stories have a formula of a sort. That there's always the hero, which is usually us, there's always the antagonist, um, the enemy, which doesn't have to be our physical person, but a set of circ circumstances, or just the other, as the populists would say. And that there's always a clash between us and the other. And uh, in that tension, in that clash, basically the drama is being lived. And through that drama, is we, if we do things uh, the right way, we should be coming, coming out as the winners and that drama should be resolved. And as we know, uh, in the populist world, the drama never stops because as long as the drama is there, the populists have, uh, have a job and uh, they have a way to manipulate us. Uh, and why are we reacting to strong stories so strongly? Because that's how we evolved. 
we are evolved for storytelling and through storytelling and our brain simply simply cannot cannot help itself uh, whenever we are in the vicinity of a really really strong story we just automatically kind of react almost most of us and everybody's got a story that they react to and basically the story um, uh, overrides many of our rational faculties and facilities and that's why we so easily led and education is not kind of a strong defense from that it is to a certain extent but without a very very specific archetypal narrative training uh, it's not going to be good because uh, a very strong uh, manipulation tool is kind of without a, uh, uh, is flying under the radar of our realization and under the radar of our uh, rational faculties and also um, uh, understanding emotionally what is being done to us. So that's kind of an interesting space, I think, for marketing people as well because uh, marketing storytellers of all kind, I mean, they are the people who really are the masters of the human nature, they really understand people in the human nature and they really understand stories. That's why they're su successful in selling things to billions of people worldwide. And uh, it's exactly what I used to do as well, exactly that the guys like us could be the new catechists in the new schools to actually teach people how stories actually work and how to defend ourselves from uh, strong archetypal uh, storytelling. So that is one kind of literacy that I would like to see in schools from the very, very early age. The second one is the impulse literacy. Uh, the impulse in a way that, again, we have become fantastic consumers, mostly working on impulse, and really bad citizens. We've abandoned the space of the uh, citizen activism, most of us, or a lot of us, and we are really ready to kind of go after our impulse and acquire the new gadget or do any new trendy thing that comes along. Um, and that impulse is actually really leading us astray very often. Why? Because we live in a society that is built, deliberately built as a political economical system to constantly stimulate our impulses in order to sell. So we live in an impulse uh, um, uh, inducing world across the board everything is emotionalized everything is affected even media the news particularly the media the news is affected if it's not emotional it's boring it's dull and it doesn't make money and it doesn't engage attention and uh, the particularly um, important thing for impulse literacy is that we also are surrounded by technology and as we know particularly mobile phones are deliberately made to uh, to become to make themselves addictive and to hook us up on those technologies, which means that our impulse is continuously uh, controlled by these devices. And uh, Tristan Harris and from Google, ex-Google, and many others have pointed out to exactly that phenomenon that particularly mobile phones, uh, they call them the dopamine pumps, uh, engineer the operating systems and the notification systems are engineered to constantly tap into our impulses and actually constantly, constantly uh, keep us hooked up to them. So impulse literacy is um, in many ways uh, preyed upon by the archetypal narrative uh, 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 approach, simply because as a strategist, as an ex-advertising strategist, one of the first things I would like actually to use in trying to sell a brand to consumers or a product to consumers is to see whether there's kind of any impulse behavior already that we can tap into and whether there are uh, whether there are any other similar artifacts that we can use as the door into the uh, consumers feelings and the consumers behavior and um, I believe it was Tristan Harris who actually called the whole game uh, the race to the bottom of the brain stem meaning that we have to move from the front prefrontal cortex rational thinking uh, uh, all the way down to the lizard brain where things are done uh, on habits and on reflexes and once a brand a technology um, an idea gets to that particular level it's quite actually difficult to shake it off so impulse literacy would be the second one that I would teach in new schools the third literacy is the uh, attention literacy and uh, attention illiteracy is the result of the first two Probably the biggest epidemic, I would say, that is happening in the world at the moment is the attention illiteracy. We simply do not know how to control our attention. 
And narrow tension, as we know, is a very, very narrow reservoir, uh, is a very small reservoir, a very narrow pipe. And uh, there's not all the things that can go through it at the same time. So something has to give. And usually what gives in the modern world of attention illiteracy is most of the important things. Um, uh, the environment, the planet we live on, the society, uh, even our families, uh, our self-improvement and many other things actually give way to other things, particularly based on impulses and archetypal narratives that are eating up our attention. So most of us are going around cognitively overloaded with too many things to, to juggle. Uh, we are very anxious uh, and uh, we are very often confused simply because we do not have time to reflect. We don't have, have time to really think about what is going on uh, to us. And by constantly changing, change, uh, chasing the impulse and constantly uh, letting our attention to be distracted by a lot of different things, but many of them trivial and truly irrelevant for our lives, I think we got to where we are, uh, where we are now. Uh, attention illiteracy is um, uh, it, it has many uh, manifestations. I guess one of the manifestations is the so-called digital obesity. Digital obesity, not my expression, uh, is that we cannot control the way that we use our time these days. That we binge uh, for hours and hours and hours on various kinds of content, uh, despite the fact that we are, uh, the next day we are tired at school, we are tired at work, uh, that we are distracted. Uh, and digital obesity has become uh, also a big problem together with uh, all sorts of... Uh, 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 addictions that we see in, in the modern world. Uh, how to uh, create attention literacy? Uh, first of all, by doing the first two literacies. The second one being aware how the algorithms work, for example, because algorithms tend to really uh, take us into different pre-planned um, directions which very often have um, political or financial uh, objectives behind them. And um, uh, the algorithms are actually trying to, in a way, hack our attention, as is modern marketing and modern advertising uh, through strong storytelling, uh, in order to hack our attention and to take that attention elsewhere. We live in the attention economy, as the old expression goes, and as they said in Google, where I spent some time as a senior strategist, um, money follows attention. Whoever gets the attention uh, is able to monetize it. And that's why attention has become uh, a really uh, one of the kind of most valuable currencies of the modern, modern world. And that's why we live in a society that is really predatory towards our attention. Uh, this, the whole ecosystems around us with a very predatory relationship to our attention, uh, putting just the monetizing of the, of the attention above anything else in the society, including the society itself. The fourth illiteracy is the team illiteracy or teamwork illiteracy. Because uh, algorithms and many other artifacts and dynamics in the modern society actually keep us um, isolated as an individual, atomized as a society, we uh, are losing our ability to work as a team, which means that we have to empathize with the other side. We have to listen to the other side. We have to be able to understand their point of view. And through understanding their point of view and understanding our own point of view, then we, uh, which means impulse literacy, we have to be able to actually then build a common ground and from that common ground build a common interest as well. Now, teamwork literacy is an interesting thing and especially important for the modern uh, post-industrial uh, society and the so-called uh, already mentioned fourth industrial revolution simply because many of the jobs that we are working in today and that are developing around us are not solitary jobs it's not something that could be done in isolation but actually requires us to be from us to be part of a team which means that uh, the only way for us to work is to work as a part of a bigger unit as the digital guys very often say uh, the unit of delivery in the digital world is the team rarely it's an individual so if you don't know how to work in a team, we're going to have a problem actually finding a feat in that, this modern world. The second one is that uh, uh, the teamwork depends on empathy. And uh, the empathy training has to be part of uh, the new educational program. And by empathy, there's lots of approaches for that. But for me, one of the most important ones is what Professor Todd Rose 
uh, whom I had a real privilege actually to listen at Google, is the, uh, uh, he's the, uh, an academic who created the new science of the individual and a lot of Google and several other companies uh, of a similar kind, of recruitment and uh, uh, people science and people management processes are based on, on his and similar thinking. Um, Professor Tadros has created one immensely important concept called the Jagged Profile. And the Jagged Profile is key for uh, uh, understanding our place in a team and in what particular ways we can assemble a team from different Jagged Profiles and different kinds of players uh, to get the, the, the famous synergy. What is a Jagged Profile? Well, uh, each of us has some strong sides to our personalities and some sides that within certain contexts are not so strong. There's no in absolute strong or not strong. Everything is contextual and everything depends on the context. Talent uh, means context. You could be extremely talented and appreciated in one context and completely marginalized and not being thought of contributing anything in another context, although you are the same person with the same talents. So talent needs context in order to be recognized as talent. And that's why the Silicon Valley companies are much better than traditional companies to actually get good talent in. They're simply trained through these particular systems to recognize talent better than the traditional guys. Largely by having less traditional ways of um, recognizing talent and assessing talent. And the Jagger Profile is one of them. The Jagger Profile means that the first thing that we have to do is define the profile of the position that we are filling in, the job position that we are filling in, really precisely. And then we are finding and trying to find the right person that is filling all those dimensions, that the jagged profile of the job fits the jagged profile of the person, meaning that all the strong sides and the weak sides are uh, aligned. What do I mean by that? Well, let's take the famous phrase, a person has to be a really good communicator. You heard it many times, right? What does it mean? It can mean anything. A good communicator in a way that somebody presents to a camera like myself, relatively relaxed. Somebody goes on the stage and presents to 200 senior people doing a really brilliant PowerPoint presentation, making jokes and everything else. Or somebody who's completely petrified in those situations but is absolutely brilliant one-on-one, uh, -on -one, managing the members of the team. Uh, 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 or somebody who really builds um, uh, horizontal relationships with other teams in the same organization, somebody who is a really good ambassador, but could be a, uh, a staunch introvert and absolutely useless at brainstorms. What kind of communication do you need for this particular position? Because it's very difficult to have all of them, impossible to have all of this in, in one person. So that's why we need to really precisely define the jagged profile of the position first, then actually trying to find a person that is going to fill it in. And that's one of the key aspects of a good teamwork, that as the many special units like the SASs of this world know, it's complementary skills, you make a puzzle from complementary skills. Some of those are maybe overlapping a little bit, uh, and some of those are quite different and specialist, but actually we need to have the right jagged profile, the right pe uh, puzzle pieces in order to make uh, the whole. And that's one of the trainings and one of the things that we are simply not taught at school as well. We are not taught from the point of uh, a member of the team, nor from the point of uh, somebody who is trying to assemble a team. The fifth literacy that we need for the modern world in order to reduce the amount of manipulation is the statistical literacy. And it's a really important one because numbers are supposed to be scientific. Numbers are supposed to be objective. Numbers are supposed to be our defense from manipulation. But actually, as we know, so many people and organizations and players have found so many innovative and ingenious ways to use numbers to manipulate us. And statistics is one of the key uh, uh, areas of manipulation in the modern world. So we have to be trained in statistical thinking as well. There are several aspects of this one that I think could be crucial in, um, in, in this particular kind of literacy. One is for sure uh, the difference, knowing the difference between the average and the typical. And as we know, these two things are not the same because average could be hugely skewed if on one side or both sides of the of the spectrum of, uh, of values, we have some kind of extreme examples. A small number for extremely high or extremely low uh, numbers, and then the average is going to be skewed. Typical is a more realistic measure 
of um, uh, what is really going on uh, in, in reality around us. And Professor Todd Rose also talks about it in his absolutely seminal book, critical book for, for understanding the modern society, also the book that I've learned from, uh, myself about the Jagged Profile from for the first time, uh, the book called The End of Average, because average doesn't exist on a personal level, only on a group level we can measure some trends provided that the, the, the numbers are kind of correctly uh, analyzed and the numbers are correct, but typical is usually, typical values are usually much better um, projection of reality than average. So that's kind of the first thing that we need to learn, what's typical, what's average, uh, because that may help us kind of uh, uh, see whether somebody's trying to manipulate us. The second one is understanding the concept of the base. When we measure something from a certain base, well, if the base is really, really low, and we have a quite kind of quick uptake from a very, very low base, like zero, suddenly everything is going to look like hundreds of percents or thousands of percents of improvements. Well, yes, because the base was really low. And just understanding the base and the typical may kind of give us the gauge when somebody claims that they are really successful about a particular area or in doing a particular thing, whether that's really true or just kind of a uh, statistical wool over our eyes. And the third statistical or one of the key statistical and psychological things that we should be trained in, which is really difficult because it's evolutionary ingrained into us to be bad at it, is the, uh, the probability how we calculate what is our relationship to probability. How can we actually think how probably is something in the future, whether something is going to happen or not going to happen in the future. Because of the really bad human brain's um, ability to, uh, to deal with probability, because we, it, it hurts us when we are not sure what's going to happen and what is happening and what's going to happen. Our brain really doesn't like... Um, vagueness, doesn't like unconnected things. So we immediately start making narratives. If that's the case, we start making narratives. And instead of, we fabulate probability. And instead of actually having a really decent uh, shot at what the kind of real probability could be about something, we invent all those stories and then get ourselves very often into lots of troubles because of that. So these three concepts in the notion of uh, 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 statistical literacy I think would be critical to learn from the very, very early age. Finally, we have uh, the creative literacy. And yes, that has been mentioned by, by many people before. And what I mean by creative literacy is maybe slightly different from what other people are, are talking about. Um, by creativity, I mean, um, many people say that creativity is the um, ability uh, for extreme associations we are able to connect things that are usually not connected or very sit kind of very far apart on some sort of associative spectrum but actually connecting them together on some sort of kind of common characteristics could be called a creative act and um, uh, we usually again we learn creativity uh, uh, in a utilitarian way how to use it in graphic design how to use it in advertising people who want to live from the entertainment industries or in the ent entertainment industries uh, learn creativity as a form of writing or visual storytelling in order to make money, in order to, to become famous. We actually, we do not learn creativity as the science and the art of uh, different, which means that in our schools, all the creativity is basically killed. Why? Because we are reverting back to averages. That's how the industrial um, educational system is made uh, at the beginning of the 20th century to condition and prepare people for factories. And that means creativity goes out of the window. Now, in the post-industrial world, creativity is critical, uh, but creativity means difference by default. It means uh, variance. It means something that gets out of the usual, gets out of the average, get, gets out of the regular process. It means uh, a lot of... Um, difference that we have to find a way to accommodate within the same system and that's really difficult and many many systems are not made for creativity schools particularly there was a fantastic nasa uh, uh research that is mentioned in the article that is accompanying this this film uh when nasa developed uh, a new uh, a test for measuring creativity applied it on their scientists and it was fine but actually just now just out of curiosity, they wanted to actually do it uh, on five, four to five year old kids as well in the school. They picked 1,600 kids and did exactly the same test on them. And the miracle was that uh, more than 90% of the kids 
uh, actually indexed incredibly highly on creativity up to the level of genius according to the test scale. So more than 90% of the kids were geniuses, creative geniuses. And that was absolutely shocking for the NASA scientists. Now, when they've done uh, the research uh, sometime later, that score dropped to 30% when they've uh, uh, done the, the, the test, when the kids actually got into the adulthood, it went all the way down to 2%, which means that the industrial schooling system that we got it today is simply designed to kill creativity and variance of all kinds. So creativity today means that we, in school, deliberately, with a firm ideology behind it, are going to actually push that, actively say, we want to nurture uh, a, a neuro uh, non-typicality. We want to nurture all sorts of eccentricities. We want to nurture all sorts of unusual points of view, for as long as they're, they're not kind of harmful to the others, of course. But within that, that's, that particular existential existentialist limit, I would call it, then we should, we must nurture a huge uh, spectrum of different, uh, actively support a huge spectrum of different uh, contrarian and non-conformist ways of thinking, because that's cre what creativity is all about, and allow them a platform to uh, express themselves in many, many, many ways. Of course, this video is a pessimistic one, and this is a pessimistic message. Because I think that we are very, very far from deploying these six literacies, even in, the, in its basic form, in almost any of the educational system that exists in the world today, including very, very highly developed countries. I also think that one of the um, mistakes we are making is that we believe that just general education is going to be enough. And it's not uh, just by reading uh, classic literature and just reading a lot of books, we do develop empathy, we know that. But actually, we do not learn the ways how the humanities today are weaponized against us. We simply are not taught the defense from those dark arts. We just kind of uh, uh, assume that things are going to happen uh, 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 by itself, but they, they're not. We have to have a very active training in these particular skills and these particular literacies. Um, and as George Orwell famously mentioned uh, in the kind of opening lines in his famous essay, uh, The Lion and the Unicorn. I'm kind of vaguely loosely going to quote it because I'm, I'm, I'm very good at remembering sentences. Uh, he said something along the lines of, um, here, here I am now, kind of almost in a, in a, in a, in a ditch, uh, 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 while the highly civilized beings are flying overhead trying to kill me. So general education is just not enough to make oneself highly civilized or particularly not enough to stop somebody uh, falling for a strong archetypal emotional story, uh, for stopping somebody reacting on an impulse and controlling that impulse and making somebody more uh, attention literate. Uh, we need a very specific training modules uh, or specific training program for these six literacies if we want to save the world. And marketing people Storytellers of all kinds have a huge role to play in it. Uh, film directors, editors, screenwriters, copywriters, um, strategists of all kinds in the marketing world. Well, here's, uh, here's a chance for us to wash our karma and to do something good for a, for a change. To do something really good or real good for a change. Not just our usual platitudes about doing a good thing here and there, helping somebody, a charity or something. That's not enough. We really have to train the world how to resist us, 